After seven years, six seasons and three different casts of actors, Netflix's The Crown has officially come to an end. And after the five strong seasons that came before it, were they able to stick the landing for one final send off? We're ready, ma'am. I'm Matt Rogers and join me as we take a look at part two of the final season of The Crown and discuss how they wrapped up this sprawling series. And spoiler alert for the entire series if you haven't yet finished it. Now I'm bringing you weekly videos covering the best and worst of movies and television and delivering it straight to your subscription feed. So to stay up to date and support the channel be sure to hit that like button, subscribe and ring that bell to not miss a single thing. Well I've been saying for some time now that we could expect part 1 and 2 of season 6 to be really emotionally heavy, but I don't think many of us were prepared for this. This season held no prisoners and took no breathers, and this really emphasised how strong the Queen had to be during this entire period of her life. Part 1 of this season was focused primarily on Princess Diana, culminating in her tragic death. Check out my review on part 1 if you haven't done so already. And viewers assumed that part 2 would have the Queen step back into focus, but what really surprised me was the focus still remained off of her for the first few episodes at least and shifted to her grandchildren Harry and especially William, and the Will's mania that followed him everywhere he went after his mother's death. As much as I was itching to see more of Staunton, I do understand why they used Will's viewpoint rather than the Queen's, as it really delved into how her boys felt rather than the royals and the rest of the world. As much as this was a tragedy that affected millions around the world, this was their mother, and Charles was really the only one close to understanding how Will and Harry felt. After the cold and shut off persona we've come to expect from Prince Philip, what a surprise it was to have him be the one to break down the wall between Charles and Will, and I guess who better equipped to do so. Harry really is shown as the total antithesis of Will in so many ways, I guess that is telling of how they ended up later in life. Whilst Will makes his best attempt to live a normal life at university, meeting the beautiful Kate Middleton whilst in attendance, the spotlight finally swings back to Queen Elizabeth and her ever ongoing predicament regarding the relevance of the crown, and whether the correct answer is to adapt or to remain with tradition and be the country's foundation that the Commonwealth has come to expect and depend on. As it has in the past, the Queen's opinion on this matter does waver, but after having everyone's input from both sides, she maintains her resolve and powers forward as is, now with more purpose and motive to do so. It was really interesting to see those positions that the Prime Minister aimed to remove, and the love these people have for their hereditary professions. They of course sound pretentious if you're just hearing their titles, but when you put a face to their name, a passion to their name, it's easier to understand why their positions weren't just thrown away and abolished. The insecurity and humbleness the Queen showed towards Tony Blair was a side of her that we don't see often, but really if relevance is what she was seeking, who better to win over the public? Not that it did him any favours a few years later. Speaking of Blair, I remember a behind the scenes video that was going around a while ago showing the Queen walking the streets as they removed her face from various locations. It was thought this was a dream sequence where she was imagining life after her death, but this was instead her insecurity about Tony being seen as king rather than her. But the Queen's attention is then shifted to one of, if not her closest friend, Princess Margaret, whose health scare whilst abroad is enough to scare the family more than Margaret has many times previously. But then her health quickly deteriorates as the strokes become more frequent and debilitating. The framing of this episode is expertly done as it's centred around one particular night in the Ritz, where a young Elizabeth is seen enjoying Margaret's type of lifestyle if only for a night. This method of using flashbacks to tell this story throughout the episode is so well chosen, as it shows the closeness the sisters have always had whilst also showing the type of woman Queen Elizabeth had to put aside in the name of duty. This episode was completely emotionally exhausting, as it was relentless in how it showed the events of this time period. After the princess's strokes started, they were constant and her physical decline only accelerated from there. 
We then hear about the events of 9-11, one of the Queen's closest friend Porchy dies, and then the Queen is obviously nowhere near the point that she's ready to say goodbye to her sister, who has been with her for as long as she can remember. We see some beautiful and heartfelt moments between the sisters before current day Margaret is seen saying goodbye to Elizabeth as they go their separate ways. And the opening scene of the following episode follows the death of the Queen Mother, which is almost too much loss for one person to handle. But let's take a beat to talk about the casting. I've said it many times before and this season was no exception, for the most part. William and Harry weren't the closest looking to their real life counterparts, although their mannerisms and performances in general still were. But the young Queen and Princess Margaret, those actresses were uncannily similar to Claire Foy and Vanessa Kirby. It almost seemed like they were deep faked. It's incredible that they can find actresses that have such a close resemblance. In the final few story arcs, we got an unexpected look at the scrutiny the royals faced over Diana's death and the unfortunate choice of party outfit that Harry chose, all this leading to the grand finale. We all knew that Claire Foy and Olivia Colman would be returning to close out the series, but we didn't know when and we didn't know how. It was so insightful to delve into the Queen's thoughts through the catalyst of conversations with her younger self, giving us an actual interaction between these three powerhouse actresses. These scenes were such a good character study showing how she views herself at different points in her life, young and middle-aged, and why she never chose to step down as monarch. There was a huge emphasis on death and legacy here, which I can't help but think was added or at least modified to fit the series after the real life passing of Queen Elizabeth. And that ending scene, the vision of her own funeral, pondering her legacy and viewing her own coffin whilst the actual song from her funeral Sleep Deary Sleep plays. Finally being joined by all three actresses before she leaves the chapel. A perfect ending paying homage to all the actresses that came before. The finale really tied together everything that came before and made the whole season for me, and maybe the best episode in the series as a whole. Now that the show's over, I did another poll asking who was your favourite actress to play Queen Elizabeth and as of now, Claire Foy is in the lead by far. And now that all the queens have completed their two seasons each, I guess this is the final result. And that's it. The reign of the crown has officially come to an end. So I want to know what you thought of the final season. Was it everything you wanted it to be? Let me know. I'll be down there in the comments. You can continue to see what I'm watching by following me on TikTok, Twitter, and Letterboxd, which are all linked in the description. But if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe for weekly videos covering the best and worst of movies, television, and pop culture. If you subscribe during this video, then welcome aboard. This is Matt Rogers, and that is all.